PC. And when you click on that, you'll see that we've updated our website with a COVID-19 business resource center that has the latest and greatest updated information. Um, I'm sure part of the reason that most of you have signed on for this webinar is that there's just an overflow of information available that seems to change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, couple that with the fact that the news is covering things in different ways. So I often get people calling me saying, I want the loan program that does X and there really isn't any such thing. So to, to make it the most streamlined way of getting what's actual information out to small businesses, we've created this part of our website. It's, I think they've done a terrific job. Um, it generally updates several times a day. And if you want to make sure that you're getting the information pushed to you instead of having to look at it on our website, you can sign up and be a client and that way you'll be getting it um, for sure. Um, our sister organizations are SCORE, Fairfield County SCORE, for anybody that's worked with them, they're a terrific organization, um, probably the busiest in the country, um, and Women's Business Development Council. We're all three free for you to use. Um, and uh, we are staying as up-to-date as possible. So, so far there are three sources of assistance, three different buckets of funding that I think are relevant and helpful for small businesses. Going from left to right, the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, that's where we're gonna spend um, some time talking about today. It's a federally funded program geared to give you um, up to $2 million of a loan, very low interest rate, three and three quarters for uh, for-profit businesses, two and three quarters for nonprofits, got a nice long repayment term. Um, this was launched first, I think it's probably three weeks old at this point. Um, and they were trying to create a fast turnaround to get you access to that capital. Um, and anybody that has logged on to the system to apply will probably find that it was tedious and uh, you had to log on at six in the morning to, to not get crashed. So they've done two subsequent iterations, I think, of as of last week. This loan program is uh, much more streamlined. I think it probably takes about 20 minutes to apply for it. Um, the good news is that They've uh, resequenced it. So upon, upon providing um, some very simple basic information about your business, um, you can apply for a $10,000 grant or advance that they are making available. Um, they're saying it's within three days. What I'm seeing is more like seven, but still that is you know, real money to be put into your bank account quickly, which I think is great. Um, and then the second phase of that will be um, once they've, given the grant, um, they will get back to you if they think you're a good loan, ca um, loan applicant with the process. And that should probably take a couple weeks. Um, the middle column, the State of Connecticut Recovery Loan Program, um, that was made available through the state. It was quite overwhelmed. They were supposed to be putting $25 million up to work. They ended up putting 50, and it's still, they had to close the program as of March 27th. There has been some talk about reopening that. Um, I don't know if or when that will be, but I do know that that's the kind of information that we tend to get pretty quickly and would be on our site. So on the right, it's the CARES plan, the, the CARES Act that was passed through Congress and federally funded. And as part of this act um, is the Paycheck Protection Plan. I think anybody who's listening who tried to go to a bank and make an application for this would, would vouch for the fact that the fact that Congress passed this is not the same as the loan being easily available when you go to your bank. And while the for-profit program was supposed to be launched on Friday, many big banks were not, were, were not ready. They didn't have um, an operational system in place to take a loan. So many of the larger banks, I think Chase and B of A, pushed it off to this week. Some of the smaller banks actually did a better job um, and were able to collect um, some applications, but very few and far between were available on Friday. Um, and they were, um, everybody's planning to get that launched this week. So I'm gonna spend most of the presentation talking about that. Let me just 
But um, one final plug, if you have not done the economic injury disaster loan application in the last week, I want to make sure that people know it is the best practice we're telling our clients is to reapply. If you applied three weeks ago and haven't heard anything, um, and or if you applied and got some feedback, but you want to make sure that you're in the queue for getting the, the grant, just go in and reapply. There is a streamlined application, as I mentioned. This is the website to go to. This is what you should see when you get there. Um, it should take no more than 20 minutes. Okay, so when we think about the Paycheck Protection Plan relative to everything else that we've heard about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the Paycheck Protection Plan is designed to cover a handful of discrete expenses um, over an eight week period. And the eight week period is any eight weeks really between February 15th and June 30th. Now on the left here, you'll see a summary of the program. I'm gonna go into excruciating detail later, but just to make the one point that keeps coming up in the questions I'm getting is can you apply for, yes, you can. Um, they're here for slightly different purposes. They are, um, you can see that they can overlap in the sense of both targeting payroll expenses, but as long as you do not apply for the exact same expenses for the exact same time frame, you can apply to both. And we can talk about a strategy um, for bucketing what you're looking for in terms of a loan from each of the programs so that you remain in compliance. Um, and it does, and we will go into this a little bit later, um, but so just so you know, you can apply for both. The Paycheck Protection Plan is sized by the formula of two and a half times your business's average monthly payroll. And there are a couple different ways to look at average payroll. It differs if you're a very steady business versus a seasonal business, but we can talk about that a little later. Um, the interest rate on the Paycheck Protection Plan is 1%. Um, there are no payments expected for the first six months, so you do get that immediate deferment, but the, the loan will um, have a term of two years, whereas the federal program, um, it, the loan can, can be out there for 30 years with no payments for the first 12 months. So who can apply for the Paycheck Protection Program? And I think one of the elements um, that took Congress a bit to get through that we're happy where they landed is really any business out there that is a small business, which is fewer than 500 employees. There can also be some SBA approved franchises and importantly, sole proprietors self-employed people and independent contractors are, um, are able to apply for this. Um, nonprofits that are small in size can also apply for this loan. Anybody with a 501c3 with fewer than 500 employees. Um, tribal concerned businesses that are applicable under an SBA size standard can apply and veterans organizations as well. Who can't apply? So um, any multi-level sales organization, some MLMs cannot apply. Um, real estate developers, life insurance companies, anything speculative. Um, nonprofit organizations that are not considered a private nonprofit. Anything with a business model around gambling. So I think that's defined as anything deriving more than one third of their annual gross revenue for five by legal gambling activities, um, any casinos and racetracks. So businesses whose purpose for being is, is gambling. Um, as I said, this is a diff slightly different summary, but the maximum amount you can get under the Paycheck Protection Program is up to two and a half times the average monthly payroll cost with a maximum of $10 million interest rate of 1%, term of two years. There are no loan fees um, that will go to the SBA. There may be a lender application fee, but that should be capped. Um, and importantly, there are no prepayment penalties. So you can take this loan, you can 
prepay it at any time. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of this. Um, the effective date for the Paycheck Protection Plan is beginning on February 15th and ending on June 30th. It's that time frame, And the goal of it is to bring workers back who may have been laid back or on the verge of being laid back onto the payroll. So the businesses must have been in operation on February 15th. That could mean that they were in operations that may have laid people off. That's okay, but they must have been in business. So we can't be starting a company on the back of this program. Um, the covered payroll costs, and we're gonna cover this several different ways in detail so that you can understand it, are salaries and wages up to 100,000 per employee. So any real high earners that you have, they will be capped at 100,000. So the way we calculate payroll costs, very simply, there's a list of included payroll costs and some excluded. Um, and we just need to, to bucketize those and, and look at them. So included payroll costs. This can be anything, um, salary, wage, commission, similar compensation, um, any payments for vacation, parental leave, family medical, sick leave, any payment for group health, any insurance payments, retirement benefits, um, state or local taxes assessed. So really you look at your whole payroll costs and the people who, um, if you use an outside payroll company, many of them are coming up with a quick product that allows you to summarize what this bucket all looks like for you. Um, so anything, any compensation for employees um, who are outside the state, outside the United States is excluded. Um, and as I mentioned, any compensation over 100,000 also uh, excluded. Any qualified sick leave, leave wages for which you can get a tax credit under this same plan would be excluded. So when you think about the fact that there are a lot of um, a lot of incentive programs out there that have come out in the in the last three weeks to deal with the coronavirus, you can do them in it, you can do them in combination as long as you are not looking for uh, not using the exact same um, categories for your business for multiple incentives. Um, for sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed people, again, they can apply for this the same way. They may end up give, providing different information um, to back up the calculation of what they, they are needing for paychecks. These are largely 1099s, and to the extent that these type of workers may be um, less steady or um, you know, success-based employment, there's a look back to last year over a certain period of time that you can use to calculate what these averages are. So I think I mentioned that the banks were supposed to start taking applications on uh, last Friday, April 3rd, for most businesses. For sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed, that application is supposed to be ready this coming Friday, the 10th. So this is the, the, the gold standard list of what you can use this, uh, this program for. And when we're thinking about the most efficient way to size the loan that you want, this is what I would look at as being the most important page. If you're gonna take uh, a picture of one of these pages, this would be the one. So payroll costs, which is what we've discussed earlier, the various categories of payroll. Costs related to group health care, just as I mentioned, that was my son. Um, any employees, commissions, tips, things like that. Interest on mortgage obligations, not your principal, but they will pay the interest on that. Um, rent, including rent on a lease. Any utilities for your business. And any interest on other debt incurred prior to obtaining the loan. So hopefully this is kind of clear. Um, now, these are the funds that the Paycheck Protection Program is going to 
forgive if you use the loan proceeds for these categories. And that's why it's so important. So the, the reason why this program I think is so appealing is that, um, that you're able to use the proceeds um, in a way that directly supports your people and your business's fixed costs. Um, and that once you've proven that you've used the proceeds for these categories, the loan will be forgiven. And how that actually works, except it's different from a grant. I get asked this question a lot. When we talked about the, um, the grant coming, the upfront grant coming from the SBA's economic injury program, that is a flat, um, a flat check that's usually direct deposited into your account. You're not expected to um, repay that or account for that. This is a loan forgiveness program, which means it's structured just like a loan. Once you are, um, once you make your application, you'll be hopefully um, accepted for a certain amount based on the, the, the paperwork that you provide and the justification of your um, fixed costs. Um, and that will be structured as a 1% loan with a two year payback period. And my hope is that these are processed very quickly, um, but that later this year, let's call it like third quarter, when you can aggregate the evidence of how you use this loan, you make another application to the bank and say, this is my application for forgiveness. This is how I've used the loan. And then the portion that they accept will be forgiven. And let's say you get a $50,000 loan, and then when all is said and done, you've used $40,000 for acceptable uses, they will forgive the forty, dollars and that ten dollars will, um, will be expected to be repaid. So the, the key question here is by being very detailed and organized about your projection, um, and really making sure that you are using the, uh, the loan proceeds accordingly. So to get the full benefit of loan forgiveness, businesses must keep their employees and pay them at least 75% of their prior year's compensation. So the goal is to make sure that your employees are paid. And the loan, the amount of the loan that may be forgiven will be reduced if your average number of full-time equivalents during the forgiveness period is less than um, the average number after. So the idea, and I get this question a lot, and certainly a lot of restaurant businesses are not going to be able to, um, to validate that they've kept you know, Joe, Susie, and Sally, who were here in February, that they're still here at the end of the summer because people change jobs and you can't control that. And that is okay. But what you are going to need to prove is that you had three full-time equivalents at the beginning and you have three full-time equivalents making roughly the same salary or within that 75% range at the end. To the extent that you have had to reduce people's hours or furlough them or lay them off prior to applying for this, that's also okay. The goal of this program is to get people hired. Um, so to the extent that you can bring people back on who you might have previously let go, that's okay. They can count in here. Um, to the extent that you end up hiring different people, that's okay too. So I'm gonna go through the next four slides and just show you the borrower application form so that you're familiar with what's gonna get asked. Um, I think that this is a fairly simple form, um, but you know they're asking for basic business information on top. You know, are you a sole proprietor, partnership, C Corp? I mean, a lot of people have forgotten this, but it's easily find outable. Um, your business uh, tax identification number, address and I would make sure that this is the same address that you have registered your company with the state of Connecticut. Then you're going to um, go through your average monthly payroll. There are a couple different ways to look at this. If you have a very stable business and I ask you your average monthly payroll and it doesn't really change, then that's what you want to put in here. To the extent that you have, um, you know, more of a, a a gig type business or a seasonal type business, then we should look at this and figure out what the right time frame is. 
your number of employees, and then the purpose of the loan. So I think you know many people would payroll, lease, and utilities. It's probably all of those. Um, but if it's not, you can just choose which ones are applicable. Um, on the top here, you need to provide all the owners of 20% or more of the equity of your business. There's going to be reasons for this. Um, I think any loan ends up going is going to end up um, looking to your 20% or higher equity holders um, in terms of what they are personally able to. Um, you know, they, it will look for a personal financial statement for each of the people with 20% or, or more equity. Um, the questions below, these are just checking to see if the applicant or any owner is presently suspended, disbarred, declared ineligible by any department um, within the federal government. Has anybody already obtained a loan from the SBA that is currently delinquent? I think those are the two disqualifying factors here. Otherwise, you know, they do ask you, have you received an economic injury disaster loan already? You'll need to provide um, detail on how what you're looking for here is different from there. Usually people have not received that loan yet, so the answer would be no. Um, and then these are some legal questions that you will also have to answer. If you are a franchise, they want to know that whether this is an approved franchise. So this is just all about eligibility. And then you need to validate each of the things on this final page here about being in good faith and in good standing. So you need to, you need to initial that you were in operation legitimately on February 15th. Um, that the current economic uncertainty make this loan request necessary so that you can survive, that the use of proceeds is as you've said it is to retain workers and maintain payroll or make mortgage interest payments, that you will commit to providing lender documentation about this information on an ongoing basis, you understand the loan forgiveness process, and during the period February 15th to the end of the year, that you will not receive another loan under the Paycheck Protection Program. This is a program where you can only apply once. So what are lenders looking for and require documentation? So this is a little bit of a summary um, that you make sure that you are not trying to duplicate the loan proceeds and that is something that you will have to um, explain and document. It should be something that we can easily do. Um, and that you haven't received a duplicative loan. So the kind of information that um, the borrower will look for, um, and again, I don't think I've mentioned this, but this program is one that is going to be um, applied for using a, a bank that is part of the SBA's 7A loan program. So it's most of the local banks around here are part of this program. Um, and the documentation that they'll look for is very similar to what you would need to provide for a standard loan. So business tax returns or an end of year profit and loss statement. Not everybody's had to do their 2019 tax returns yet. So um, a QuickBooks uh, balance sheet should, uh, balance sheet and um, P&L should suffice instead. Um, some payroll forms, and that can be through your payroll processing. It also could be 1099s. And then verification of the number of employees and the payroll for the most recent 12-month period. So this loan um, is, uh, is not guaranteed in any way, so they're not looking for collateral for anybody or a personal guarantee. Um, and all applicants are allowed the payment deferral for the first six months. As I mentioned earlier, starting April 3rd, small businesses and sole proprietorships, I think I might have misstated that earlier, um, were, are supposed to be able to apply already. And next Friday, this Friday the 10th, independent contractors and self-employed people can use the same program. So the questions that I'm getting asked as I wrap this up and make time for all of your questions. 
How do I get for forgiveness? Hopefully I've made that clear. So you make the original application through your lender. Once you get the loan, you put the money to work, then you apply for forgiveness once you're able to validate and prove that you use the money for the right, um, the eligible expenses. Can I get more than one? No, you can't. Everybody can just get one PPP loan. Um, so that uh, you make sure that we, you get this right and you're, you're looking for the, the max that you can get. Where should I go to get a loan? Now, this is a question that um, was kind of hot on Friday because with, um, there was a lot of press covering this process and this program and people expected to be able to go right into their bank on Friday and write an application. And what we found is most banks were not, a, were not ready for that yet. Um, the place to start is any bank that you currently have a banking relationship with, a banking, a business banking relationship. Um, I think by this week, everybody, I haven't heard of any bank that doesn't think that they're going to be ready this week. Um, I have heard that when people are calling their banks, they're saying, well, you don't have the right kind of um, business relationship with us or they're not getting the right answer and my advice is just keep calling just keep asking for a different person um, the people who are going to give you the most attention from that application process are going to be banks that you have um, that you have a relationship with most banks are are feeling a little overwhelmed by this program right now and they are um, working with their existing clients first and then they'll make it open for, for new clients. Um, any SBA 7A lenders are eligible for this program around here. Um, the banks that I'm hearing in addition to obviously Chase and B of A who were two of the larger um, institutions who are not available. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, they were just not ready on Friday and expect to be ready this week. But Webster Bank is ready and available. Um, First County Bank, ready and available. Laurel Road, ready and available. Peoples, similarly ready. Key Bank, ready for their people. So I think there isn't anybody that you can come up with. Um, TD Bank also, as of today, ready. So I think everybody locally should be ready. Some of the applications are fully online this morning. Others, you may have to um, upload things, but I, I am hearing much better things. Um, and we're here to help. So um, I think last week was crazy. It was a crazy week in a crazy month. And I know that dealing with all of the forms and uh, you know, all of this application process is not easy, especially when there's so many different things to apply for. I don't want anybody leaving, thinking, throwing their arms up and saying, I, this is too much. I don't want to do it. You have so many people who are here to help you. Um, my organization, we've got 12 people and this is all we're doing. Um, I put together this webinar and I'm going to do a, another one videoed so that the information is out there to get started. But to the extent you hit a, a sticking point, please, I think on the next slide, or yes, this is my contact information. Um, here's my email. Here is my phone. I think the, the worst way to get me is to leave a voicemail because it's a little overrun right now. But I'm very good with texts and I'm very good with email. And I'm going to stop there and start answering your questions, if that makes sense. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go top to bottom here. So I'm sorry if people were raising their hand in the middle of this. And I think I didn't actually see that that was happening. Um, I'm currently working with a local bank listed on the site. They are yet to have their web portal functional. Yes, I'm growing concerned as other banks are processing applications. Do I have reason for concern? That's a really good question. I think that um, as of this morning, I do believe everybody is very close to being able to process applications. Um, I wouldn't be concerned that other people are getting their application in and you aren't because I haven't really heard of any great experiences at all happening last week. So. The larger banks weren't even available last night when I looked. 
Um, and this morning, I think it's still the smaller ones. I think, as I said, the best strategy is go to the lender that you've worked with before. You may need to be a really strong advocate for yourself and keep calling and politely asking them to, um, to make sure that you can get in there. Will nonprofits have their loans forgiven if used for payroll? Yes. At the end, can you explain if, oh wait, where did this go? At the end, can you explain if a Chamber of Commerce qualifies? I believe it does. I will tell you, I am not um, an expert in the nonprofit world, so we have to check, but I do have a lot of guidance about nonprofits that I can send, uh, send along if you email or text me. Uh, okay, we have some independent contractors who are paid monthly with an annual contract. Could they count towards the payroll? Absolutely. Um, so the only complicating thing is um, independent contractors could potentially file for themselves, but so you, they can only be, um, they can only, their compensation can only apply once. So if you're going to apply for them, um, that's great and just let them know so that they're not duplicative um, and, and applying twice. Is a 501c6 eligible for PPP? I don't know the differences between a C6 and a C3, so I'm going to have to get back to you on this. Um, there is a very uh, long description of the nonprofit world, how that works. And okay, if you normally, I work as an attorney, as a contractor, and I own a small business. May I apply for PPP for each? So two loan requests. So I think if as long as these, you've got things set up as two different uh, business entities, I assume that if you're an attorney and you work on contract that you would have an LLC for that and as a separate LLC or C Corp or something for your small business. So then you, yes, could apply for each. And you can apply for the um, economic injury disaster loan grant for each as well. Okay, here we go. If you normally pay a bonus at your end, how do you figure this in? So that is the kind of situation where you um, would have to probably write a description of how this works, but you want to look at your payroll for the year and the, the bonus would be included in that. Then you divide it by 12 and then you multiply by two and a half. Hopefully that's clear. Um, how do you calculate the full-time equivalents for forgiveness? So there are a couple different dates that you can look at when you want to dis when you want to sort of put a stake in this in the ground about how many full-time equivalents you had at the beginning. But basically, what I want you to do is think about like how big a loan do we want to get, and how many people are we trying to cover in that, and that's what you're going to request. So. Let me give a different example. So if you had, you know, 10 employees um, in January, and then as this started to happen, maybe you're down to five, and those are the five that you want to make sure that you're paying. And this is going to probably cover an eight-week period in between February 15th and the end of, um, end of June. So if you want to high, if you want to apply for a loan that is that you have a high degree of feeling like it's going to be forgiven and you have five people on staff and you kind of want them to be uh, part of your business through that time period apply for five don't apply for ten if you have already made different decisions about that first five but anybody that you realistically want to compensate for an eight-week period that you're going to be able to do so um, and if those five, you know, if some of them, you know, disappear or go somewhere else that you could really reasonably hire a replacement for, that would be your number. Okay, next. Our business looks very different in 2020 than 2019. Well, everybody's does, right? Um, twice the lease in a new location and many more people working for us. For example, how do we explain document this so that we get a loan? Yeah, so I get that. Um, I have a client or two that's like that too. So you logically were, or you already had a plan to grow your business. So when you do the look back in 2019, that doesn't look like the same business. 
and the loan that you could get on those numbers wouldn't cover it is what I think you're saying. Um, so then there's a different time period that you can look towards for big changes like this. So I don't think you wouldn't look back to 2019, but there's a much smaller look. And then you can also document that um, with your payroll in January, and you're probably gonna be in a situation where you wanna do sort of a simple one page write up with your application for the bank. Um, one of the strategies that we tell people to use when they're doing these applications or the original SBA application is if you feel like there's a part of your story that doesn't come through using the application that is given to you, find a way around it. Write yourself a one page summary in plain English and find a place to upload that in because it will end up part of your file and somebody will read it. If you have part time employees, should the 100,000 well, where'd you go? Limit be adjusted. So is a person working 60% is the limit 60,000. I actually don't think it's that smart. Um, maybe it should be, but I do not think that that is the case. If you have more than one company, can you apply for each company? I think I answered that already. So as long as they are separately, um, uh, you know, separately organized, so two separate LLCs, two different corporate structures, then, then yes. Hi, Christine, what is the best way to show that this loan amount is not being used for the same expenses? This is a great question. And why this is such a great question is because you do have all these programs available and all you have to do is prove that you're not used, you're not sort of double dipping and take us an Excel spreadsheet. It's how you'll probably figure out um, the amount that you want, but do your Excel spreadsheet. Now, when I think about the PPP and the calculation that you'll use, and it's two and a half times your monthly, um, you know, your monthly payroll, and it includes these other things, like there, it, it's a little bit like filling out a puzzle. But the time period that it's supposed to be app applicable for is February 15th to June 30th. And there's more than eight weeks of payroll in there. So there is a way to create your, um, your or split the, the proceeds of different loans between maybe the economic injury loan and the PPP so that the eight weeks that is going to be forgivable under the PPP, you allocate there and you use everything else as an idle loan that has a 30-year you know, term. Uh, what about Bankwell? Two people asked. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but I will add that to my list. On one side, you mentioned an economic injury loan. Is this different than the loan, a different loan? Yes, it is different. So there are two loan programs and happy to go into more detail about that. Um, the economic injury loan, it's, we're calling it an IDA loan. It's, um, it's a federal program. It was the first one that was announced uh, about three weeks ago. And if anybody hasn't applied for that, you absolutely should. Earlier in the presentation, I provided the link. Um, the most compelling part of that is that they will advance you up to $10,000 very quickly. Okay, next. I am at an LLC S Corp with a 1099 contract employee. Do I apply for the loan for this employer? Does employee? Yeah, either one could do it. Um, I think to the extent that you're already filing um, for a pay, you know, for, for this program because there are other expenses that you have, um, you know, like rent and, and other things, it may be easier to just simplify and you do it for the 1099, but they certainly could do it on their own if not. Um, I managed one, right, okay, got that. Contractors such as bookkeeper and tech support are ongoing, but not within the PPP scope to calculate 2019 payments. That's a really good question. Um, and you know what, I'm gonna have to get back on that one. I expect that those expenses should be covered under this. Um, and just because it's uh, a bookkeeper and tech support, there's no reason to think that that wouldn't be counted, but I'm gonna double check on that. Who ultimately decides the amount we can apply for? Our payroll is currently higher now than it was a year ago, so our average payroll, okay. So I think I answered this question for somebody else. 
what I want you to do is apply for two and a half times your current payroll. Like that's what you would need. Um, and if you need to justify that or you need to look back a little differently, then, then do that. Do you have some general advice for the self-employed or independent contractors if they should be, if they should be do PPP or file for unemployment insurance? I think that you should probably be provide, um, you should probably be prepared to do both. Um, I think if you really want to maximize how this is working, you do the PPP for the max that it would cover you, and that's going to be a hundred percent of your um, compensation, um, whereas the unemployment insurance is, um, is probably not gonna cover you 100% even with the added benefits, but if it does, then, then you might be better with unemployment. But I would look at the amounts that are made available and, um, you know, and make a decision there, just so I'm super clear. So, if the amount that you could get for unemployment is now currently 100% or close to it, maybe you just do that. But the PPP should, should provide coverage um, for the total amount that you were making. So for that you know, eight week period, it's certainly a benefit. Is the application the same for nonprofits who don't have owners? Yes, it is the exact same, I believe. Um, but when you put the ownership um, information in there, you can just write NA. Okay, in 2019, I was an independent contractor for a company provided with a 1099. 2020, I'm an LLC with a partner. Will this be a problem to apply as it is different this year? Well, that's a good question um, because you have a very small window of a track record. Um, but I think you could combine the information that you have for 2019 as your look back and as soon as long as your businesses are largely the same and you have the same um, expectation of uh, of salary or compensation it should work um okay here we go. Can a company apply for both the PPP loan and the Connecticut loan as well? Yes, you absolutely can. Again, you can't apply for the same uses of proceeds. So for the Connecticut loan, if you're able to get that, what you want to do is exclude from proceeds anything you'll get for the forgivable portion of the PPP loan. Uh, we are to turn in the last 12 months of payroll, so part of 2019 and year-to-date 2020. Yes. Um, I think that if I were doing this, I would make sure that I had um, what 2019 payroll looked like and then also year-to-date 2020, which is, you know, any number of things could have happened. Also, can I apply for my own pay that I take home from my LLC's S-Corp? So I think what you're asking is for owners of businesses who are not, um, who aren't salaried, who take their, um, you know, take their distribution at the end of the month. Absolutely. So the idea is to sort of summarize that in a logical, meaningful way, and then call that your salary for the PPP application. And I think one easy way to do that is to look at 2019 and look at all the money that you took out for the year. And sort of annualize that into a salary that you can, um, you know, divide by 12, multiply by two and a half, um, and you should be there. I set up as an LLC but have no current income yet. What benefits can I apply for? Hard to answer that. So um, you need to show to be eligible for these, um, these programs, you need to show an economic injury as a result of the crisis. If you have an LLC but don't have, haven't had any current income, I think that argument might be difficult, but um, feel free to reach out to me personally if there's a longer story than you can type in the chat. Um, is this supposed to help with unemployment? Is that why they're saying it's five weeks to get employment to see how many people go back to work? I don't actually know the intention of, I think the idea is, um, it's supposed to help businesses manage in this time of uncertainty, right? So 
nobody really thinks it's best for all these businesses throughout the country to be laying people off in uncertainty when we really kind of think that by the summer things will be back to normal, right? Because then you'll have to hire people back and it's a pro you know, nobody wants that. I think what they, they're saying here is we think this is a temporary thing. Um, we think it's a very unusual temporary thing. So why don't we give you the money to support the people that have been your employees for this, you know, kind of eight week period. And then you'll still be connected enough with them that getting them to come back to work will be easy. Can an independent real estate broker apply for this? I actually don't know. Um, I know that there is some confusing language. I'm gonna write that down and do a little research in that. I think there have been, there's a little confusing language with regard to real estate. Now, I don't see why a broker couldn't apply for all of this. Um, I think it doesn't have anything to do with the speculative nature of real estate that is excluded in this, but I don't have a good answer for that. Can independent contractors who you've counted as part of your payroll cost count towards your forgiveness? Absolutely, they are exactly who we're trying to get the forgiveness for. What if there's nothing for them to do? I know, it's crazy. It's a little bit crazy. Um, so I think that this is an opportunity for business owners to take these incentives and treat their employees well in a time of stress. So there are many businesses that are banned from being open. So there isn't, you could be effectively paying people to not work, which seems silly. Um, but if it distresses everybody in this process, that's probably a good outcome and you will look like um, a very kind employer. And so that's one reason to do this. Another reason to do this is that it's possible that your, you know, your business is not um, you know, operating as normal, but you can use people in a slightly different way where they can work from home and, and do something that is moving your business forward. So, um, so that's helpful. Okay. Can you repost your contact? Absolutely. I'm sure that is, will be available somewhere, but um, I will try and figure out how to get that up there at the end. Where do you enter rent and utilities? Um, that should be also, that should be one of the easiest things to validate because it just doesn't change that much. So that should be on a worksheet that you provide to the bank. How do we get a recording of this presentation? I am not certain, <laughs> but I recorded I, it, Christine. As long as you give us permission, we can post it to our YouTube channel. It's up to you. Totally great. Great. Um, if my company is an LLC and I pay employees a salary, I pay myself a draw. I think I accounted for that, right? We're just going to estimate the draw uh, realistically based on last year's probably a fair way unless there's a different story and then do the math. I'm a home remodeler. Homeowners don't want me at their houses. Totally get that. I have my own home that needs an addition. Not quite done. I can keep myself and some crop tractors working at my house for months. What loan do I apply for? That could be a little tricky. Um, I think that you may have to be, that might be a little tricky. I mean, clearly, if you are paying people to do this work, I mean, it's hard to imagine that you're going to pay yourself to do work on your own house, but you could certainly pay the subcontractors working on your house. But that may be a tricky situation that we want to work through one-on-one. -on -one. Do you know how quickly the 10,000 advances being processed versus the idle loans and the state of Connecticut loans. I'm super awesome that you have applied for all of them. Um, so if you have not, uh, this could be like the most valuable thing you get out of this presentation. Anybody who has not applied for the $10,000 advance, which is part of the SBA idle loan in the last week. So I mean like last Monday, do it again. So Originally, when the SBA put up this website, they were not trying to make that 10,000 available quickly. The new version has a resequencing where that will happen. So if you applied already, it doesn't matter. Apply again. It'll only take you 15 or 20 minutes to get through the application. And then they're saying that that 10,000 advance should be made available within three to five days. Now I'm thinking what I've experienced so far is more like seven, but it's quick. So do that. Then 
the longer term eye to loan, I still think you're probably a month out from hearing from the day that you originally applied. So if you've applied one and a half to two weeks ago, there's still time. Um, and then they have an underwriting process to that as well. And then the state of Connecticut loans, you should be appearing, you should be hearing back very quickly. So I think the, the, the answer is reapply for the idol where you're going to get the advance. The advance should be quickest, the state of Connecticut loan second, and then the longer term SBA loan. I'm self-employed in LLC. Will the PPB cover my salary and what I pay myself? Yes. What you're paying for yourself is forgiven. Yes. As a small nonprofit, we have a modest reserve account, not an endowment rainy day fund. Is this, no, it doesn't hurt your chances. Like they want to keep people, people employed. That's the purpose of the PPP. And if paying salaries out of your reserve account was not part of your business plan, which I'm guessing it wasn't, then it should not. If we haven't sustained a loss of business yet, but foresee sales slowing down, can we qualify? Um, yes, generally speaking, this um, expectation of loss is still a little vague because we all, none of us really know how this is going to turn out. So you need to be, you need to explain um, the impact that you foresee. And as long as it makes sense, I think that's fine. There are some seasonal businesses that we've worked with that, you know, really reasonably have not experienced a loss because their businesses were summer only and, you know, restaurants at summer locations, um, you know, really weren't, you know, they did most of their business in June, July, and August, but it's pretty clear people think that they will sustain an injury so that it would work. So let me pop back up my contact information for us to sort of end with. And again, please visit our website. There's so much good information on there. If you wanna make sure that you're getting information pushed out to you, instead of having to look, one of the easiest way to do it is to, to sign up um, to be a client on our site. It's free, um, you know, it takes about five minutes. But um, my information's on there. Please feel free to email, to, you know, text is good, phone calls is my least, least efficient way of getting back to you. But um, thank, yeah. you so, thank you so much for answering those 30 plus questions. I'm sure everyone really appreciated that. Um, I know we're running really short on time. I noticed that some people did answer their questions in the chat feature directly. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of these you probably answered. I don't know if you want to just like skim it and see if there's any questions that you think would be helpful to answer for all, or if you just want to sort of leave it at what we covered so far. Um, do you see what I'm talking about in the chat feature? I see like three questions here, but I think I answered those. Okay, great. If I scroll up, um, yeah, self-employed. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just hope that these questions were duplicated in the Q&A feature. Yeah. So Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Good luck out there. <laughs>